the very nice thing with our consortium is that this is really a big family. So there is a really friendly attitude with, with all the members I have. This is really friends, mean by many of my colleagues, not just colleagues. And that makes it really together with just the enormous success of the Gaia mission and the great astrometry and all the other products we are producing. This really makes it a great experience in my life, which I really would not like to miss. I would say that there are two things that I find most interesting. One is the technical side of getting the very best out of the observations. And the other is to see the marvelous science that come out of these measurements in the end. The, the data that Gaia is going to produce and the catalogs are going to be basically the reference in astronomy for the coming decades, impacting many, many areas of astronomy. Something like Gaia could not be done by a single nation. But uh, with the cooperation of all the European countries, it's been made possible. Gaia mission provides a large variety of interesting challenges. The pure scientific ones, but also the technical issues that processing such a huge amount of data provides. The experience of working for the last 13 years in Gaia has been an endless source of inspiration and knowledge. Gaia is not like other space projects in my head. I am already 20 years in Gaia, and I am still uh, looking at Gaia like a small children in front of the Christmas tree. I have a lot of things which are all extremely interesting. Gaia is just such a great mission. There is so much great science coming out of Gaia. I'm so proud to be working for this great project. Gaia is awesome. Welcome Dr. Michael Biermann from the Center of Astronomy of the University of Heidelberg. Michael, you are the manager of the Coordination Unit 3 in the Gaia Data Processing and Analysis Consortium. What is the role of the Coordination Unit 3 or CU3 within the Gaia mission? The aim of Gaia is to provide a census of the stars and other objects of the Milky Way and beyond. And the CO3, the Coordination Unit 3 within DPAC, aims at providing the astrometry for all these sources. So astrometry, that is about the positions, mainly the positions of the stars, plus the distances whenever possible, plus proper motions for all those stars where we clearly see that they move over the sky with time. That is the main data products coming from CO3. Before we see for the very first time data really from the satellite in CO3, there's a long way for these data to arrive. That is mainly going from the satellite to the ground stations, which collect the data, send them to ESOC, that is the European Space Operations Center, where Gaia is operated, that is close to Darmstadt in Germany. And from there, the data is transferred to our data centers. Uh, one is in Barcelona, where the first steps are done, and the other one is at ESOC, close to Madrid in Spain, where the astrometry at the end is done. So the very first steps we do with the data coming from the satellite is to transfer them, to store them in a data format that is more easy to use for the downstream processes. And then the very first thing is that we calibrate this data, a rough first calibration that allows us to determine the fluxes we, we see for, from every single observation, the centroids of every single observation. So when the star has been observed, where on the sky? And these data at the end then are cross-matched. So we link every single observation we do with Gaia to stars. Yeah, so that we have a census of all the objects we are dealing with and know for every single object which observations really are linked to that. And once we have this information, then we can do the real astrometry, that is the determination of the high position, positions, proper motions, uh, parallaxes, etc. So this is a long sequence of many, many steps before we really arrive at the data products we really publish in the different catalogs we have provided so far and will do in the future. Welcome, Professor Linde Green from the University of Lund in Sweden. Leonard, already 20 years ago, you invented the basis for Gaia's astrometric solution. And in 2001, you mathematically defined the basic steps, how positions, proper motions, and parallaxes or distances of stars and other celestial bodies can be determined from the individual Gaia observations. Can you briefly explain to us the logic behind ages the astrometric global iterative solution for Gaia? There are two telescopes in Gaia, and each of them can be thought of as a big digital camera that sweeps across the sky as the satellite rotates around its axis. And 
every five seconds or so, a snapshot is taken of the part of the sky to which the camera is pointing right then. So over, say, five years, you will get about 30 million such snapshots or frames covering the whole sky. And each frame contains tens of thousands of star images. Now, the problem is to put together all these observations of the stars into a consistent system of positions, parallaxes, and propagations over the whole sky. If you go back and look at one of these frames containing maybe 10,000 star images, if you knew exactly where on the sky this frame had been taken, you could simply project it back on the celestial sphere, and that would immediately give you the positions of these stars at the time when the frame was taken. How can we determine the pointing of the telescope? Well, if we knew the positions of the stars, it would be simple to work out the exact pointing of this frame. So we have this apparently unsolvable problem that in order to determine the positions, we need to know the pointings of the telescope, but in order to compute the pointings, we need to know the positions of the stars. And indeed, if you only had one frame like this, it would not be possible to solve this. But remember that for every star, it has been recorded in hundreds of these frames. And that opens a possibility to solve this problem. For imagine that you start with the star positions that are not very accurate. You could take them from existing catalogs, even the old ground-based catalogs that all astronomers have in their libraries. Starting with these positions, you can compute approximate pointings of the telescope for all the frames. And then if you use these pointings to compute the positions of the stars, you will get positions that are a little bit better than the ones you started with. And then you can use them to compute the pointings again, and so on. You can loop through this determination of the star parameters and the pointing parameters as many times as you want. And when you have done it a sufficient number of times, the results will not change anymore. Then you have reached mathematical convergence. And then you have the solution that you want, which simultaneously determines both the positions, parallaxes, and propagations of the stars and the pointings of the telescope at the corresponding times. Simultaneously with all these star parameters and pointings, you also have to determine a large number of instrument parameters that describe the distortion of the instrument and how that changes with time and so on. But you can incorporate this also in this scheme, in this loop that you go through many times, and that determines these parameters in addition. Aegis was used in all previous catalogs. The latest was the Gaia Early Data Release 3, published on December 3, 2020, containing more than 1.7 billion stars. How accurate are the data in this catalog? The very brightest stars, in fact, all that you can observe with the naked eyes, are not very accurately observed because they are simply too bright for Gaia. And the faintest stars that Gaia can observe are not so accurate either. But somewhere in between, you get the best accuracy. And then we are talking about something like 15 or 20 micro arc seconds for the parallaxes. If you look at a millimeter from a distance of 200 meters, that occupies an angle of one arc second. For Hipparchus, for example, we measured accuracies in milli arc seconds. That is a thousand of an arc second. And to get that, you would have to place this ruler at the distance of 200 kilometers. And Gaia can even measure something like 100 times better than that, almost. And that means that you would have to put this ruler halfway to the moon or something like that. Then you would get a scale in micro arc seconds. In early data release three, we basically reached the accuracy that was targeted for a five years mission based on only three years of data. Welcome Jose Hernandez from the European Space Astronomy Center, ISAC, close to Madrid. Jose, you are the technical manager of AGES, the Gaia Astrometric Global Iterative Solution. Leonard Lindegreen has already given us an overview on the scientific background and the important steps to produce the Gaia catalog from the individual observations. What is your role in AGES and how many astronomers and software engineers are working in your team? Yes, so I'm managing and coordinating the use team. Basically, most of the, the work is basically coordinating the, the activities performed by uh, more than 15 people, which are basically from the, the AGES teams. We have scientists uh, specialized in astrometry, like uh, Lena Rindegren, 
or Sergei Clearer, and also have a team of software engineers and computer scientists, basically, with a yeah, strong background in uh, mathematics and instrument calibration. So my main role is basically to coordinate and plan the activities so that we can plan and deliver the solutions that basically form the part of the Gaia data releases in due time, basically. What are the technical steps to produce the Gaia astrometric solution and how long does it take? Yeah, the, the production of the solution itself takes a relatively short time, something like about a month. There are many different stages, steps that we, we need to do. But before that, there's been a lot of preparatory work and we have done many, many tests, experimental runs, trying to improve our calibration model. <clears throat> That's basically what it takes most of the time. So this is what we do in order to try to optimize and get the best solution with the data available and the time constraints that we have. And this is a process that typically takes less, more than one year and also involves other team where we basically try to understand the data, its behavior, trying to, to get the best possible solution for a given guide data release. Also, there is a lot of work related to validation of the solutions, scientific validation, and also documenting and publishing the, the solution itself. What are the main challenges and difficulties in the production of the solution? So basically, we are now at the level of the microseconds, so we're trying to, to get rid of systematic errors and random errors that we have, which are very small, the tens of microseconds or hundreds of microseconds. This is extremely hard, basically. It means that we need to try to find the reasons for these effects, which are very subtle. Most of the time, basically, is spent trying to remove them by modding them, basically. In 2016 and 2018, the first two Gaia data releases were published. And on December 3, 2020, the first part of the third Gaia catalog was made publicly available, containing data for about 1.8 billion stars. Now you are already working on the next data releases. What will be the main improvements? So in data release four, we're going to double the amount of data that we are using. This uh, already will improve the solution because it gives you more, more measurements, basically. Uh, so random errors and especially proper motions uh, will become more accurate automatically. But also the, there has been a lot of improvements in the systems that uh, produce the data used by AGS as input, basically intermediate data update, uh, which basically computes the, determines the image parameter determination, uh, has improved. So the, the quality of the data that we will use as input is better. And then in AGS, we continue to improve our calibration models. So data release four is for, uh, going to be much better than data release three in terms of uh, systematic errors allowing astronomers to, to go to reach further and further. Welcome Dr. Xavier Castaneda from the University of Barcelona. Xavier, you are the manager of the intermediate data updating within the CU3. IDU is an important step before the Aegis solution can be performed. Can you briefly describe to us what intermediate data updating means in the context of Gaia's astrometric calibration? IDU is in charge of two main tasks, the calibration of the astrometric instrument and the image processing of all the at-kite measurements to derive location of the sources and the fluxes. Location and fluxes are computed by processing the tiny images that the spacecraft sends on ground and using different instrument calibrations that are also performed in IDU. In order to perform IDU, a lot of computer power is needed. Can you tell us what computers you are using for IDU? The data management and processing power needed to produce the Gaia catalog releases is one of the most challenging aspects of the Gaia mission. For the third Gaia data release, we have processed up to 78 billion observations from the first 34 months of data. And for the next release, we will process twice this data. For this reason, IDU needs a lot of computing power, and it runs in the most powerful supercomputer in Spain, Mare Nostrum, hosted at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. In its latest upgrade, Mare Nostrum offers a peak performance of 13 petaflops and a disk storage capacity of 14 petabytes, which are more than enough for IDU processing. In fact, for the latest release, IDU has performed 1 to the 21 floating operations, 1 sextillion, or what is the same, 1,000 million, million, million floating point operations. And we estimate that for the next release, we will need 10 times this amount of processing power. 
The accuracy of the forthcoming Gaia catalog will, in principle, progressively improve as new data is fed to the processing chain. We have used 34 months of data, and for the next release, we will have twice this data volume. But of course, what we also need to do is to evolve our calibration models and calibration solutions to the evolving condition of the astrometric instrument. Welcome, Professor Sergei Kiona from the Technical University of Dresden. Sergey, Einstein's theory of relativity plays an important role for the Gaia mission. Can you explain to us what kind of relativistic effects have to be considered in the analysis of the Gaia data? Actually, the most uh, amazing aspect of Gaia is its accuracy. And to reach this accuracy technically is one story. It is a lot of technical efforts, but to interpret their measurements so that you make sense out of it from the scientific point of view is another story. And during this process of interpretation, one important aspect is relativity. So at the level of one microsecond, there are a lot of relativistic effects which play a role here in these measurements and should be taken into account. It starts with a very, very well-known classical astronomical effect, which is aberration. So the aberration should be considered with full uh, relativistic accuracy to reach this one microsecond. You need the whole uh, theory of relativistic reference frames, a whole a career of the reference frames, starting with the reference frame around Gaia, which is physically adequate for an observer moving together with Gaia, and then farther and farther basically uh, the barycentric reference frame and so on and so on. In the middle of all this process, I mean, on that one side, you have uh, relativistic aberration. And on the other side, you have these definitions of parallaxes and proper motions and relativistically meaningful way you need to find them. In the middle, you have somewhere a light propagation from a, a object on the sky, somewhere a star, and you have a Gaia here and th this light is propagating. We need to, uh, to model this motion of photons, of, of light rays, basically, to very high accuracy. We need to take into account not only the classical light deflection in the gravitational field of the sun, but also uh, we need to take into account uh, smaller gravitational fields uh, from the planets of the solar system, for example. And the biggest planet is, of course, Jupiter, but we have also other planets. So Saturn, for example, is also important. For Jupiter and Saturn, we can observe very close to these objects. And we write down the formulas uh, describing the light deflection close to those bodies. We will see that there are many different effects which contribute at the level of accuracy which Gaia can reach. So all this uh, will be mapped with Gaia. How successfully we should see, but at least these are our plans. To, to test everything we can test with this data. And this is certainly a very interesting result which Gaia will provide, hopefully, in the future. Uh, there are some small regions in the sky where stars are missed by Gaia. I will talk about this now with Dr. Katja Weingre, who is an expert on this question. Katja, can you explain to us what kind of regions these are which are missed by Gaia? Gaia usually looks at the sky and if there is a star, it places such a readout window around the star. And then this readout window is downlinked to Earth. And then later in this readout window, you find the source that you want to see or this star or object. And then you can see how bright it is and uh, where it exactly lies. Now, some regions on the sky are so dense. So there are so many sources next to each other that Gaia just can't handle it this way. Because if you would have such a readout window, there would be 15 sources in it. And you, it would be all these readout windows overlapping. And it, it's just an overkill to the standard procedures. And every time Gaia touches these regions, this will trigger a readout for these SIF images. And then a SIF image is taken when such a dense region is visible. All observations of the same source are grouped together and you find which observation belongs to which source. And then you can calculate this, the source position and brightness from this. This step is called cross-match. And once you got that, once the cross-match is done, then you take your sources and then you actually do the real calculations, which then determine the astrometry, which is the exact position of the source, and the photometry, which is the brightness of the source. 
Um, and then these are the things that we want to publish in Lima. So the positions and the brightness of all these sources in this huge, very filled SIP images. We are now done with the first two steps, as I said, and we aim for doing astrometry and photometry in the next one or two years. And then the full Gaia catalog is going to contain also the SIF sources. So there will be no longer holes in the centers of the dense regions. And even the people working on stellar clusters or on the center of our Milky Way will have more complete data sets.